Welcome everyone to Coaching in Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I'll be your mindset coach today. And today we're going to be having on a guest. She is a health and wellness coach, Carrie Marifino. She's going to be talking about general health and wellness and then relating it into what are going to be our priorities in life. Because if we think about health and wellness, it's not just, okay, well, I'm going to eat healthy. Oh, I'm going to make sure I go to the gym. It's a little bit deeper. What do you need in your life right now in order to feel recharged? What do you need in order to be happy, to be ready to tackle the next day tomorrow? And not looking at if you have an ineffective day as being a failure for the rest of the week. There's this idea of small victories that we have here at Reverend Concepts. That no matter how small the victory is, it is a success. It is a victory. And we cherish that. So if we're supposed to go to the gym five days out of the week and you only go once, we focus on that one day. We focus on that one small victory. Because that one small victory leads to more. Because if you look at the four days, your brain is going to say, you know what? We're not going to the gym. We're supposed to go five days. We only went one. We didn't even go to the majority. So now we're in that state of mind of not being proactive. And it's difficult when we get there to get out. So we just keep kind of hurtling through life, hurtling through our days. Eventually burnout comes, unhappiness, unease. We're not taking care of ourselves anymore because we're telling ourselves what's the point. Because we tried it and then we weren't successful. And then we might try it again, but we fall off again. Health and wellness is going to be talking about that where we're looking at what we are doing, what has been done or has worked, and then we are starting to look at today. Is it working still? Is it still effective? Is this still good for me? Now, if we look at when we are younger to where we are today as adults, things have changed. Our diets, our bodies, our minds, all of that will play a role into health and wellness. So let's dive into that interview with Carrie and myself, and let's begin to learn how to be more healthy and more well in life. Welcome, Carrie. Mayor of Fino to Coaching and Session. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, Michael. Thank you for having me. Of course. So today I have you on as a health and wellness coach. And you do more than that. I know you do things with mindset, with just getting into a better state of mind, life, et cetera. There's so much you do, but in your own words, can you explain what you do and how you help the world? Sure. I am actually a health and wellness coach, but I'm a certified personal trainer and I'm also certified in yoga for flexibility and range of motion. So I help my clients um, on a one-on-one basis and also I have corporate wellness clients. So I help them figure out, you know, how to start where they're at Mm -hmm. and build from that, improve their health and their fitness. So I find people come to me either wanting help with, you know, their nutrition or their fitness. um, But I try to bring it all in together because they're both related and teach them along the way so that they can move forward on their own. Perfect. And what got you into the health and wellness world? My journey began years ago. My I lost my mother to breast cancer, so and she was only 62. So that really just started me thinking, you know, how healthy am I? You know, I was always interested in nutrition, Michael. So I studied it in college and just always have been learning, you know, about how foods react with your body, you know, and how, you know, nutrients just help us grow and and just perform at our best. So I started you know, really noticing when, you know, my mom passed away and that kind of put me in a, you know, a darker place, but it really makes you look at your life and your own mortality, you know, when you lose someone close. So that's really where I started and it just grew from there. So I would say, you know, after that, the next step was, you know, when I got married and had kids, you know, I really started thinking about what I was putting in my body and how it would affect, you know, my, my pregnancy and my children. And it just, I think with most people, the older you get and the more experience you get, you just learn from that, just kind of built up from that. So I've always been more of a, you know, natural kind of person and, but learning, you know, things come at you for a reason in life, right? You know, different things happen and you just need to learn with it and move on and, you know, take, take the good and take what you, you find useful. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really where I began. Yeah. When we get into that mindset, when we're young, It's kind of like we can do anything. I remember when I was younger, I would be 
jumping off sofas and doing cartwheels and how to tell my grandma, it's like, you can't catch me and things like that. And they're pretty quick though. So sometimes they can catch me and then, and then I'll, <laughs> you know, I will be disciplined. But when I was younger, I never really gave myself the idea that one day I'm going to be old and I can't run like I used to, or I can just eat whatever I want and not gain a pound where it has changed over the years. And I would say when I was 28, that's when I really noticed I had to change my diet and just my whole health regime. I couldn't do what I used to do. I mean, I started working out at a young age. I was 15, 16 years old, working out, eating healthy. I mean, I can load up on carbs when I was in high school, not gain a pound. Now I have to count almost every calorie. So I'm not gaining any extra pounds. So the body changes as we grow up. And I find that many people find out a little bit too late that their body is changing. And of course, your body's going to change at a different age. It just depends on you, your DNA, your genetics, all that. And then of course, what type of foods you like. For me, I was big on carbs. I love to eat rice, beans. My mom's Hispanic. So that's what we grew up on, rice and beans. When I was now living on by myself, I was like, I guess I have to eat rice and beans because that's what I grew up on. And then I found that, well, maybe that's not what is going to be helping me out the best at this point, because I had to shy away from the rice and from the beans. And then I started to eat more healthy in the sense of eating more greens and then having more whole protein. So like I'll have like a steak or I'll have some eggs, things like that, where before it was kind of like, I'll eat whatever I want it and things were fine. But now I really take some time out to look at my health and my wellness because it makes me a better person in the sense of I feel more energetic. I can do more when I'm more cautious with what I eat because I find when I put a lot of junk into my life, into my diet, I begin to slow down and I begin to become a little bit less efficient. I would agree with that. And I, as far as, you know, teaching our kids, um, our kids are 14 and 10 now, and I don't teach them, you know, one food's better than the other. What I teach them is to notice how different things that they eat make them feel. Because I believe, you know, in a more, I believe your body will t- give you signs, right? It'll tell you <laughs> if you're not feeling good, if you're tired and sluggish, or, you know, you just have a headache or whatever, but just to notice, you know, what did you eat? You know, what else was going on? Did you drink enough water? Just to really notice and check in with your body because it, it will tell you, you know, sometimes the signs are subtle or we're too moving too fast to even pick up on them. But it's really just about going in for a little bit and saying, okay, how, how do I feel? You know, and, and is that the way I want to feel based on my goals and how I want to perform in my life? And when you had that trauma of, of losing your mother, did you find that your diet changed? Whether you started to eat more junk food or maybe you stopped drinking more water or enough water. So you just were in that state of depression. It was a process. It was, it was really was a process. Um, I wouldn't say I started eating more junk. I always kind of ate, you know, pretty healthy, lots of vegetables. And my husband eats the same way. Luckily, you know, we both enjoy a lot of vegetables and greens and things, but I would say that my health became a focus, but I did have that period where I just didn't care for a while because it's kind of like, does it really matter right now? It's just hard to see that. And, you know, it took a while for me to get out of, okay, now this has happened. How am I going to react to that? And what can I do moving forward, you know, to make me as healthy as possible and to, you know, to feel good again, once I got out of the loss and being depressed about not having my mom, because that is, that is hard for anybody. But yeah, really, and I did go through periods where I was like, oh my gosh, I need to have every kind of test to make sure I'm fine. You know, it's kind of, it was an up and down of like, oh, am I good? And I was like, okay, no, you're good. Take a deep breath and let's focus on what I want for my life, not what could happen. You know, so that's where I really had to shift my mindset and stop looking to the outside for solutions and just look inside and realize that I was the one responsible for myself and my health that mindset to move forward instead of saying, oh, well, this happened and that happened, you know, it was, and it really was a big breakthrough for me because I didn't realize at the time that I was, you know, looking to the outside for reasons and explanations and saying, oh, well, I can get into this victim mode. But it really was an eye-opening experience when I realized, oh, hey, I'm responsible for this. (laughs) Hey, I'm in control. It's all, it's all me. So if there's something going on, let's check with me first. Yeah, I think it's important to look on the inside. I have a similar situation when I lost my great-grandmother. 
where I was eating healthy, I was doing the right things, going to the gym. When I had that moment in my life, stopped going to the gym, stopped eating healthy, didn't want to sleep. It got to the point where it's like I fainted just like in my regular day. It was because I just wasn't taking care of my body. And that was a wake up call for me where something finally broke in me or like my body said, hey, I'm shutting down now because you're not taking care of me. After that, I started to really pay attention to what I was doing. And it was difficult because I was trying to avoid it because Mm -hmm. of the stress, of the fear, of everything, of of the newness of not having that person in my life where I didn't want to move on to that way of living. I wanted to keep what I had, but it wasn't helping me. And I find that many people try to hold on to who they are, not understand their new self. So they hold on to their younger self or they hold on to the person that they were in high school that might have been a popular person. And then they just think of who they are, keep that mindset, but they don't grow into who they're becoming. I find that causes a lot of stress, anxiety, and more trauma down the road because they're not doing what is in alignment with them at that moment. When someone gets into that way of thinking where they're trying to ignore what has happened in their life and they're just not looking on the inside, they're covering everything up, maybe with a Band-Aid, maybe with food, whatever they do to cover up that hurt, what are ways that people can be more healthy about it rather than just saying, okay, well, I'm going to eat a pint of ice cream today, or I'm going to stay up all night binge watching some movies, not getting any sleep for tomorrow, so I'm exhausted. Right. And it's like you kind of sabotage yourself, right? Without even knowing it or knowing how to stop. But yeah, it's just, it's just a big shift to get out of that. And some of the things that I do, you know, someone's going through a difficult time or, you know, maybe they even just had a, maybe they're an athlete and they had a bad day of training and they're questioning, why am I doing this? You know, I've worked my whole life. Am I even doing my best? You know, if, is this working? Am I going to be successful at whatever, you know, competition or whatever is coming up? I find it helps to just connect back to your breathing and to think of something at a time, even where you were happy, you know, and to imagine it, to close your eyes and imagine that in your head and see that happy time. And once you get solid in that memory, to just breathe it right into your heart, you know, you just breathe in and you just hold it there and be grateful for that moment. I find that that. Um, along with the deep breathing and the relaxation, helps them connect and helps them connect with the present moment again. Because, you know, you can't chase the past, your past self. You can plan for the future, but the things that are most important are the present moment and how you're feeling right now, you know, and how you're connected. Are you even, you know, present with the people you're talking to? I find that that just centers you and gets you grounded again so that you can get out of that, you know, that chaotic state. When we start to slow down, we can start to pay attention. And I remember I learned how to be present. I think I was 21 or like 22 when I started to be more present. I was going out when, you know, as soon as you hit 21, you have to go party apparently. So I was in college (laughs) and, and I was going out with my friends and probably for like six months, I went through this phase going out, partying. After six months, it was kind of like, okay, I'm done with this. Some people get stuck in that habit of, okay, well, I'm going to keep partying. And it's a constant throughout their whole college career and then their adult career. I could care less on drinking, on doing all those different things or partying. I don't know if it was because I weaned it out of my system very quickly or if it was because I was always that type of person. But what I find is that in our society, especially here in America, our drinking age is 21. And we feel like when we hit that, We have to do this to prove that we're an adult. Okay, well, Mm -hmm. we're 21, we can drink. So they begin to have these habits of drinking. They're already smoking because I believe you can buy cigarettes at 18. So they're already smoking. Now they're like, okay, now I can drink legally. So they're 21, able to drink. And they're doing all these things that are not helpful for their body. Do you think that the reason why we do that is a cultural thing? Or maybe it's because we were placing those hobbies or those acts as the ability to be an adult? I think it is somewhat cultural because I lived in Brazil for a year when I was 16. I was an exchange student and, you know, they had very different views on alcohol. You know, the family was having a drink or whatever, you know, the teenagers would have a drink and it was fine. And I found just based on my experience that 
because they were allowed to have alcohol, it wasn't a big deal, you know, so they didn't feel like they had to overdo it or like this was a milestone goal that they had to reach. It was just part of their normal life. So if they wanted it, they could have it. If they didn't, it was fine. And I think here in the U.S., especially when you do turn 21, I think it, there's a little pressure. Oh, well, why don't you drink? You can drink. So why don't you? And I think there's a little bit of that, too. It's kind of like the forbidden fruit, too. You know, you just like <laughs> if you if you say you can't have something, what do you focus on? You know, what do you want? You want the thing that you're told you can't have. So, you know, I try to teach my clients that nothing is forbidden within reason, but you have to have things in moderation. You know, you need to enjoy your life and then decide, you know, how did that make me feel? And do I want to do that again? Mm -hmm. You know, and if you, and if you do things in moderation, I think your body can handle it a lot better. And it's not like a goal, like you're saying, you know, you hit that, you know, you're 18, you can vote, you're 21, you can drink. It's not like, you know, those aren't my lifetime goals. <laughs> you know, it's like, but I feel that in America, it's like, this is how, this is how it's kind of perceived. And it's like, okay, what's next, you know? But yeah, I think it is a little bit cultural and a little bit, you know, forbidden fruit. Yeah. And when we're younger, we look at our environment. I remember my father, he was a drinker, so he would drink some beer in the evenings and the weekends. And so me, when I grew up, I was like, okay, well, I have to have beer in my fridge. So Mm -hmm. I gave myself a rule though, which was a good thing that I'm only allowed to drink on Friday and Saturday. So guess what would happen? I would drink every Friday, maybe on Saturday too. So after the long week, oh, I'm so stressed out. Let me have a beer. But then I started to pay attention. How am I feeling the next day? What is that bear doing to me? It's a lot of unnecessary calories. Now I'm going to the gym. And then on Friday, it's like I'm doing all that hard work and just throwing it down the toilet by just drinking all this. I'm not saying that you can't drink. I'm not saying that you should stay away from it. I think you should enjoy a beverage if you're an adult and you want it. If you're a parent and you have kids and they ask for maybe a sip of wine, give them a sip of wine. But at the same time, understand what you want. For me, I wanted to be healthy body, healthy mind, and alcohol didn't do that for me. So it didn't give me a healthy mind and it didn't give me a healthy body. So it was one of those things I had to relinquish. And I think people have a hard time getting rid of things because they feel like they are going to be without, especially here in our current society, our current way of thinking, more is better, right? Materialism. So we're getting into the sense of, oh, I need this, I need that. And then before you know it, you have a home filled with junk. Right. And do you even use it? (laughs) Do you even go out and enjoy it? (laughs) Mm -hmm. True. Very true. With all, you get all the toys and then you're like, oh, well, I don't even use them anymore. I'm too busy. Mm -hmm. We're emphasizing busy work with our life where we have to be busy, where we can't be bored. We always have to be doing something rather than being still. Do you have any advice that can maybe help people maybe get away from smartphones, get away from feeling that they have to keep up with the Joneses and be more into themselves rather than what the world is saying what they have to be? Yeah, I think that it's just looking at your priorities and what Mm -hmm. makes you feel good. A lot of people do these things because they want to keep up with the Joneses because they care what people think or they want to please people. Sometimes people will just overextend themselves because they can't say no. And I just, you know, it's, it's hard to balance everything. The way I look at it, I'm the only person that gets to spend 24 hours a day with me. So I better be happy. Not in a selfish way, but I I realize that if I'm not happy, how is everyone around me going to feel? And it's really about not caring what other people think, you know, about what you have or don't have. But, you know, giving to people when you can, whether it's your time, conversation, no matter what it is, you know, to have some type of of giving in your life, but also taking time for yourself and enjoying, you know, quiet to yourself. You know, I recommend that people just get off their phones for a weekend, spend some time with your family or your friends without your phones. It's very annoying now when you go to a conversation and whoever you're with, you're sitting there at lunch or whatever, and they're, they're looking at their phone the whole time. And you're like, Hey, I'm over here. <laughs> you know, are you even, you know, I feel that connection is really, you know, really needs work and in, in our space right now, it's hard to, you know, say you're going to give up your phone for a while, but trust me, once you've done it, you feel so much better. You're like, Oh, I didn't really miss anything. Once you realize you didn't miss anything <laughs> you know, and that, and that you could be okay. Then it's like, Oh, I want to do this again. It kind of builds and grows because you're not getting email all the time that you ha- you feel you have to respond to instantly. You know, everything 
in this world is instant. You know, you can get everything at, you know, the click of a mouse or, you know, snap of your fingers. And I'm trying to teach our kids, especially that, you know, it's, it's good to wait for things. It's good to save up, to work and save up your money for things and appreciate it when you do get the thing that you wanted. And lots of times, I don't know if you've had this, maybe you, you think you want something and then, you know, time goes by and you're like, oh, I, I didn't really want that. For me, I I purposely leave my phone at home on accident. So I'll be going out and I'll say, oops, I left my phone on the charger and I won't turn back and I'll just do what I have to do. My phone has my grocery list. So sometimes when I'm out at the grocery store, I have to kind of remember what we need. But other than that, I mean, I don't necessarily need my phone. If anything happens, I can always go to someone, ask someone, go to a store. Phones are so readily available now. It's like you don't necessarily even need your own phone. There's so many people mm-hmm. with unlimited data, unlimited minutes that right. if you needed your phone in an emergency, someone would be able to help you out. What many people use their phone for today is entertainment or being busy. And for me, my phone is primarily for business. Uh, get phone calls, things like that, emails. But I try to delegate as much of that work as possible because me being behind my screen is draining for me. And I have so much other things that need my attention and energy where if I was behind my phone for, mm, let's say five, six hours a day, doing whatever I had to do on the phone, emails, comments, whatever, I would be less effective tomorrow. Because being on that phone is a drainer, even though we feel like we're recovering. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like I'm in a state of nothingness where I'm not doing anything, but we're actually not recharging. Maybe you can recharge if you watch certain content, if you listen to make an audio book or something like that, Mm -hmm. it might invigorate you, motivate you. There are going to be content like that. Right. But the majority of people will watch a series or they will watch like a TikTok or something like that. And they're scrolling for an hour, two hours. And then at the end of it, they feel the same as they did when they first started. And they might be procrastinating. They might be using it as a outlet to, you know, not address their boredom, whatever it be. It's not really helpful when I tell people, if they want to recharge, figure out what recharges you the most. If you know what really recharges you, in five minutes, you can be about 85% recharged. So right. for example, you might talk to a friend, literally just talk to them for five minutes. And after you feel invigorated, that's what coaches do, where if you talk to me for five minutes, because part of my process is that you can text me, you can't call me, but you can text me. So you can spend five mm-hmm. minutes and text me. And typically by the end of it, they're like, okay, I have something to work for. So they recharge right. in that moment. Or if you have kids and you're like, all right, well, you know, let's have a conversation. And that inspires you where it's kind of like now we have our why, our purpose in life, because we want to make sure we give our kids a good upbringing or we want to be able to provide for them. And something you said earlier, I want to touch that. And then I kind of want to touch base on, on like upbringing and things like that. But you said priority where you have to prioritize things. And I was wondering what are maybe three or five of your top priorities that you give yourself or maybe that you tell clients, because I think priorities have gone out the window and many right. people don't prioritize time. They just kind of move with how the world moves them. Right. And I think a lot of it comes down to time management as well. But so I, things I prioritize, Michael, are my exercise that comes first. <laughs> you know, when I get up in the morning, I like to get it done, get it out of the way. And I enjoy it. I find that even if I'm tired that morning, like maybe I went to bed too late or didn't sleep as well as I wanted to, I still go because I feel better after. You know, there's not one time where I worked out and I said, oh, I feel worse. You know, <laughs> I always feel better. So that's always a priority to me. Another thing is, and I find when I get out of balance and I'm not doing a good job at prioritizing, um, getting out in nature is very important for me. And like you said, leave the phone at home. Oops, I forgot it, right? You know, (laughs) Mm -hmm. I just enjoy being out. You know, I live near the ocean, luckily. So being out on the beach or and I I like the mountains as well, but being out in nature and even just going for a walk and getting that, you know, 15, 20 minutes of sunlight in the morning, I find that really helps set up my circadian rhythm so that I sleep better because, you know, it's it's just nature. Your, Your body knows it's light out. It's time to be awake now. If you just go right to an office or right to your desk and start working and you don't get that contact with sunlight outside, it's hard for you to feel energized, I think. Those are definitely the things that I, I prioritize along with you know time with my family. 
and my husband's very good about that too. We always, you know, the weekends are always our family time, but even just the other night, my daughter had asked me, you know, it was bedtime and it's summer, so I'm letting them stay up a little bit later, but it was almost time for her to go to bed. And she asked me if I wanted to play go fish with her. And now we haven't played that. And, you know, since she was little, and now she's 10. And at first I was thinking to myself, oh, she just needs to go to bed. It's time to go to bed. And I, I stopped myself and I said, you know what? How much time do we actually have with our kids before they're off in the world? So we played two games of Go Fish. We laughed and just had a great time. And then I put her to bed and I said, you know what? You know, how much did that 10 minutes or 15 minutes that we played add to my day instead of taking away from it? We had that joy. So, you know, experiencing joy and joyful moments like that are a priority for sure. And then when we look at health and wellness as in mindset, you both got something from that game of goldfish. You got something, she got something where it's like, okay, mom and I are spending quality time together where we're not just saying go fish or if you got your pairs and you win, it's not so much of the competition. It's about, well, you can strike a conversation with them. And that's something that's going to recharge you rather than detract from you. And then she's learning that habit where, okay, I enjoy this, right? Even though it's almost bedtime, she's not going to be recharged in the sense of wired, I can't go to sleep. She's going to actually go to sleep with a smile in her heart, in her mind. And she's going to be like, that was nice. And then I'm sure the dreams that she had that night were wonderful because her mindset was in that realm, that way of thinking. And it's so prominent nowadays that many people don't make time for those little things. They will allow negativity to run in their life, ramp it, but they won't allow those positive moments to reign supreme or to even creep in when your kid is asking for a little bit of attention, a little bit of time, because everyone's so busy. Everyone is so preoccupied with their own life that they really can't make time for someone else's. Yeah. And someone told me the other day, she said, well, my kids always want to talk to me when I'm in the middle of something, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, you know, it's human nature <laughs> because they see you're not focused on them. They want your attention, you know, but how much easier would it be for both your stress levels and your relationship if you could just stop for, you know, probably would take two minutes or less, you know, to connect with them and you would both get what you needed and probably make your productivity way better because now, you know, they're taken care of and you're taken care of. And you can both move on knowing, oh, you know, we had a good interaction and it doesn't have to take long, you know, but the, you know, not stopping to even look them in the eyes and say, no, I'm busy or I can't. It's just, I think that's gone is that connection. And I, I, I really wish people would focus a little bit more on that and interacting with people and with each other. And sometimes the ones closest to us, we take them for granted and miss those moments. So I know, I know a lot of people say, Oh, well, I say yes to too many things. I overextend myself. Well, I wrote a, a blog about how I, I don't want to say no as much, you know, and I, and I mean it in the fact of those moments, you know, I'm not going to say no if someone asks me to have a moment like that and to connect. It's one thing to spread yourself too thin, but it's another to, to always be saying no and being too busy. I think we need to say yes more to those moments and to that special time because you can't get that back. Is there a magic number that you have found, whether it be in your parent, personal life, finding balance of the numbers of yeses and nos that you can make? I don't know if there's a magic number, but I judge it by how I'm, I'm feeling. So I'll know if I get, you know, anxious and just thrown off my schedule. I'll, I'll know, my body will tell me, you know, if I'm, if I'm overextending myself or even if I'm overtraining, that's when I know I've learned over the years to listen to that. And not just say, oh, it's just because of this. It'll be fine. It's just stopping and really taking that in and seeing how I feel and listening to it. Someone said the other day to me that slow is fast. Sometimes you got to slow down to make more progress. And that's and kind of like on the cusp of, I guess, burnout. And mm -hmm. I think it's different for everyone. For me, for example, when I feel like I'm being burnt out, I might give myself an assignment or I have a task to do that week. So I write a weekly blog. And sometimes if I'm getting to that brink of burnout because I have a bunch of interviews, a bunch of meetings with clients, and I might be trying to write this blog and I'm literally looking at the computer screen for 30 minutes and nothing's coming to my mind where it's kind of like, okay, well, I'm not writing this blog today. I'm going to get up and I'm going to do something else, whether it be talking to my wife, uh, fooling around the kid, 
whatever it is, I have to get away from being in that stuck state. So Mm -hmm. like, I know how burnout looks for me. Do you know how it looks for you? And maybe if you can maybe explain that a little bit, because I think people have a hard time understanding it in their own regard to how it feels to be anxious, how it feels to be burnout and getting to that point where there's like overwhelmed and overstressed. Yes. I think for me, I can tell by, I just don't feel right. You know, I'll have that feeling of, oh, something like where you're just looking for something and you don't know what it is. Usually that'll tell me that I'm either just doing way too much or, you know, not the right things. I want to go through life having fun and enjoying it. I don't want to look at it as a chore. Like with writing your blog post, there's certain things that you, you need to get done that you've committed to yourself to do, you know, once a week or whatever the time frame is. But I found I have to be in the right mindset and the right state of mind to want to write. And I enjoy writing. So if I am in, the, if I'm getting to that point where I'm not enjoying it, then I, I do need to do something else, like like you said, and just switch it up. Because I think, especially like with exercise, for example, are you going to go to the gym if it if you're doing some if you don't like going to the gym, you know, find something you love. It could be tennis, it could be running, just walking, walking with the dogs, or whatever it is. But find what you love because we all want to be happy, right? What do you say for your kids and for people around you? You just want them to be happy. <laughs> you know, so why can't we expect that for ourselves or go after that goal for ourselves? And change change can be hard. You know, trying new things can be hard. But I think that for me, um, when I first started working out seriously, my daughter was, you know, 10 months old. My son was three and a half or so, four years old. And I had to give myself some grace. I think people will fall off the wagon because they'll do good for a couple of weeks, maybe three, four weeks, Mm -hmm. and then they mess up, right? They don't go to the gym like they said they would. And I think they're too hard on themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to give yourself some grace. When I first started working out, my goal, because of my husband's schedule and mine, was to work out one to three days a week. And on some weeks, honestly, I hit one day. And did I quit? No. I said, okay, well, next week I'm hitting my three days for sure. Because I had to do that. It was the only way that I could just keep moving forward because I didn't want to stop when I was just, you know, just starting to make progress. And I think many times that people do that, they say, oh, well, it's not working. You know, nothing's happening. It's hard to see change, especially in your body and your mind when you're in it. You know, it's the consistency. And I believe it's better to be consistently good than occasionally perfect. I think that's hard for people to, to, to grasp. But once they realize that, oh, I don't have to be good and do exactly what I say 100% of the time. No, life is fluid, right? Mm-hmm. You have to adapt and roll with it. Mm-hmm. So things come up. What do you do, Michael, to recharge yourself? I'm actually a big gym nut also. I go to the gym first thing in the morning. I love going to the gym in the morning. I don't like going to the gym in the evening. I feel like I get so much from the gym in the morning versus in the evening. I just go there to get a workout and I feel like I'm not 100%. I like to read, but that's typically in the evening. So like I'll read right before bed. Now I do fall asleep after. So it's like reading bedtime. I might be able to read depending on how tired I am. I might be able just to read one chapter. I might be able to read 90 pages that night. It just depends on my day. But typically my body knows when it's time to sleep and it it knows when it's time to wake up. I don't need any alarm clock where I just wake up naturally. And I typically wake up around 7, 7.30 latest. And I'm like, okay, I'm at the gym now. And that gives me the most energy. Watching the foods I eat is another big one for me. I have to make sure I'm eating the right foods. So if I notice that, okay, the day after I eat some junk food, I'm feeling sluggish. I knew I shouldn't have ate that junk food or I shouldn't be eating all this junk food. And it tastes delicious, but at the same time, I'm less effective the next day. And for me, one of my goals every single day is to be a little bit better than I was the day before. Now, I don't have to be perfect. And some days I might not be able to achieve that, whether because I'm sick or because life gets in the way. If that happens, I make sure that the next day is better than that day. And then Mm -hmm. I start from there. So sometimes you take a step back, but you have the idea of taking two steps forward. So I'm always trying to figure that out in my head. And I mean, I enjoy working. Work actually invigorates me. I love what I do. I used to be a teacher. I love going to school, uh, you know, working with the kids, teaching. And then when I left teaching and I started coaching, it was a difference. It was a transition, but I began to find that also invigorating, helping people. 
when you're passionate about something, it feels like you become more energized the more you speak on it or the more you do things with it versus, oh, I'm working. I'm a coach, so I'm working Mm -hmm. with clients. And at the end of the day, I'm exhausted where typically at the end of the day, I'm still able to do everything on my schedule. For me, everything is routine at this point in my life where I do have flexibility because I do put flexibility into my schedules. But at the same time, it's like I understand how much energy I need. So my body and my mind automatically know, okay, he needs this much energy today. Otherwise, he's not going to be able to accomplish what he wants. And the brain is so tricky because it will give you exactly what you ask of it. Because if you don't ask of your brain of anything, your brain is going to say, well, I guess we'll just figure things out as we go. But if you go to the gym every single day and you make it a habit, your brain is going to eventually get into that routine of, okay, this person is is going to say, all right, I'm going to the gym. He needs energy in the morning or in the evening. Whenever you decide, you create that rhythm. And you, of course, you figure out which one you like more. Some people I know, they like going to work nine to five and at five o'clock, they go straight to the gym Mm -hmm. where if they don't do that, they feel like they can't get the stress off of work. For me, I love my job. So I don't necessarily need to get stress off of work. I am very rarely stressed. Energy for me comes naturally. I used to do a lot of yoga. I still do mindfulness. I do a lot of meditation. And I find all of those things help energize me versus sitting on the sofa. I feel like if I'm sitting on the sofa, my energy is actually depleting quicker than if I was just sitting still, breathing, and just being mindful. Right, right. I agree. Sometimes I'll take just five minutes or seven minutes to reset like that. And I'll actually lay down. I don't sleep. But I just lay down and focus on my breath and meditating. I actually use hypnosis for both of my childbirths. Mm -hmm. So, and it's really what makes it work is that repetition, is the repetition of the, the meditation. And the body and the mind are just amazing. It's just like your brain, like you were saying, your brain likes to keep you comfortable, right? You start going to the gym and your body's sore and your brain's telling you, oh, you shouldn't go tomorrow, right? Because you're sore. But once you get into that habit and get past that threshold, your body starts saying, well, where can I get more energy for this? How can I make this work? Because obviously Michael's still going to the gym. So we, your brain figures it out, right? How to make it work so that you are more comfortable in doing it and energized. So I think that's, that's awesome that you have that routine in place. And I liked what you said about the energy and just you know, being mindful of that, how much you need for the day. When we talk about health and wellness, there's a baseline to it where it is going to be different for everyone. Maybe you don't like going to the gym. Well, you don't have to go to the gym, go for a walk. If you don't like eating spinach, eat broccoli. Maybe you don't like broccoli, eat cauliflower. If you don't like, but you know, you, there's always another option where you have to figure out, take some time to really figure out what you need, what you want, what works for you. And I think having a health coach is important because then they can really start to see what your life is. That health coach is going to be there looking at your life saying, hey, I think you're putting on too much work right now because you're always coming to me in our sessions. You're always stressed. Typically, the stress is stemming from work. Maybe the stress could be stemming from children or relationship, right? So this could be many different things. But if you notice that they're overstressed because of work, health and wellness is going to be looking at that. How can we maybe get rid of some of that stress from work? Maybe we can cut back our days. Maybe we can not take on as many assignments at work. So there's options. And I think having a health professional or just having a health and wellness coach look at your life is so important because, again, we're living in a busy world where We try to energize, but we do the wrong things to energize. Our phone is not going to be that source of energy for ourselves. Communication, you said it, bringing back communication, but not just communication with others, communication with ourselves. really having that conversation and understanding what you need, what you would like to happen, and then start to implement a process. And I think, again, a health and wellness coach is going to be important to start to implement that process. So you can get back to a better state of being in a better state of mind. So if I can from you, Carrie, can you please give us any last words and then please tell people where they can find you? Sure. I would say that 
I think lots of times many people don't see possibilities. And instead of saying, oh, I can't do that or this will never work, always ask yourself, what else is possible? The first thing that, that comes to your mind, you know, or whatever the obstacle is, a lot of times people stop there. So I would just ask yourself, what else is there? What else is there until you get to that answer and just thinking, you know, thinking of solutions and, and you know, maybe bouncing it off somebody, but just look for possibilities. Because I think a lot of times people are afraid to ask because they feel like, oh, well, I didn't know I could do that. Well, how come Sally gets to take, you know, 45 minutes for lunch and she goes to the gym or she goes and walks and takes some time for herself, but I feel like I'm stuck at my desk. You know, don't be afraid to ask. People would like to help and they want you to be happy and more productive. So look for possibilities. And um, people can find me on my website. It's kerrymarafino.com. It's K-E-R-R-Y-M-A-R-R-A-F-F-I-N-O.com. And they can find me on Instagram at kmarafino. I, I'm very active on there. So there's lots of ways for people to find me. Perfect. I will be throwing all of those links in the description box below. So anyone can easily find Carrie to reach out to her and to, you know, maybe begin that journey to work with her. She has such a sweet and loving energy. And just speaking with her today, I know that when she's working with clients, she's putting those clients in a state of ease that everything is going to be okay. A step at a time in the right direction is going to be progress in anyone's book. So if you're looking to make progress, if you're looking for a change in your life, Carrie is going to be a wonderful asset in your corner. I would like to thank you so much, Carrie, for coming on Coaching This Session. It was a great conversation today. Thanks, Michael. I enjoyed being here. All right, everyone, I'd like to thank you so much for watching the interview with Carrie and myself. If you understand anything about being fit, it's not just body. It includes your mind also. So if you find that your body is fit, but your mind is not, Carrie, health and wellness coach, is going to be able to pinpoint that. If you find your body is not well, but your mind is, Carrie is going to be able to help you with that because health and wellness is mindset. So in a sense, she is a mindset coach, but it it is going to be looking more so at the body, at your diet, at your nutrition, at your daily habits. And that's going to be the accumulation of what her work is going to entail. And her goal every single day is to make sure that you're in a place that every single day you feel good of what just happened. I ate pretty good. I was healthy. I went to the gym. And then it goes beyond that. Well, maybe we weren't successful one day. So now we're getting into the state of mindset. We're not just looking at that one day as being insignificant. We're looking at that one day as being something amazing. Look at what we've done. Look at what we did. That accomplishment says so much about us. And it says so much about mindset. That is the starting point to our health and our wellness journey. And though it might be difficult to take that first step, it might be difficult to see change. It might be something that you give up before you even try because you're thinking it's not effective. Well, if you keep chipping away at habits that are not conducive to a healthy and happy body, eventually you're going to break that habit and then finally be able to squeeze in better habits. So it might be mindfulness, meditation, breathing, nutrition, whatever it be, you're going to start to add those in the place of that crack that you finally made a dividend, that chip. And then you can begin to change your whole entire life. You're going to notice you're more energetic, you're more happy, you're more patient. Health and wellness does so much for the body. And many people, we get into that state of mind or a state of moment where something bad happens in our life, a trauma, negativity, and we stay into that. Learning how to overcome those problems and paying attention to our life is going to be essential for our growth in our future. So today matters. And if you are not 100% today, get a coach, whether it be Carrie or myself. Figure out what you need in order to grow. And it could be as simple as learning how to communicate with yourself. And you do that first with a coach, and then you start to implement the process to yourself. And then now you can look on the inside of what's really happening, what you need to happen, and then being certain that it will happen. 
Because what we also need with the process is commitment and consistency. If you can keep those two, then along the way, you will get to where you want to be in life. Sometimes you just need a little bit of direction. And that's what we want for you here at Coaching and Session. This is what we want for you here at Reverend Concepts. But in the meantime, if you have any questions, you can email me, session at gmail.com. All of Carrie's information, again, is in the description box below. So you can reach out to her. She is a wonderful coach. And she's going to be, again, someone that's going to be able to help you get to better health and wellness. My name is Michael Reardon. I'm a mindset coach. I will see everyone on the next episode of Coaching in Session. Until then, everyone, take care.